Uh, this week, uh, reminder, the few group that do Clemson Bible study, there won't be Bible study. I won't be here. Uh, I'll be in Wisconsin doing, leading a workshop on um, mental health and leadership for Chisholm, which is part of the UCC um, uh, health services. Um, so I've been invited there. I'm supposed to go in October, but something happened and they're like, can you do yours a lot earlier? So uh, that's what I'll be. Doesn't mean I won't be available for you. Uh, because you know, as you know, the calls forward to my cell phone. So if there is a pastoral care emergency or what have you, as long as it's not during my workshop, <laughs> then obviously I'll drive back home with care. Uh, like to keep in prayers, folks that are not mentioned in your bulletin. My father-in-law, sister Emma Diaz, had a heart attack. Heart attack and she has not come to so prayers for my father-in-law and his family also prayers for gene boss's family as they navigate the next few days in preparation for a farewell service prayers for the families of the loved ones in miami apartment building um, we can only imagine what they're going through not knowing if their loved ones are still alive under all that rumble or not um, and for those who already know that their loved one did make it. Um, numbers keep increasing, so we wanna keep them in our prayers as well. Uh, we also wanna keep in prayer all those who have been affected by the recent weather um, events, and including those who have lost folks during those events. Um, and prayers for, so uh, somewhat of an infomercial a couple of days ago on TV that kind of bothered me. Um, so prayers for people who find themselves vulnerable to those who pray, and not pray with an A, on their longing to reach God, on their longing to hear that God is listening to them. Um, and I'm sure you know what I mean when I... Places in our lives where we may resist turning to God for healing and change. Let's have a moment of silent confession. Please join me in the following. When we resist your call to open our hearts to allow the freshness of your grace to enter. God have mercy. When we close our eyes to your new and unexpected possibilities of healing and rec recon reconciliation. When we let fear overwhelm us and cling to the security of what we know instead of risking new steps toward your freedom and justice. Please join me in our assurance of grace. God's mercy. Our Lord.
Okay, I really had a different assurance of grace, I'm telling you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I saw it. Okay. <laughs> That's all <laughs> steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope, to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults, for the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. Here ends our first lesson. Please stand in body or spirit for our gospel reading according to Mark chapters 5, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet, and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. 
He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. They, then he put them all aside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come, which means, girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Here ends our gospel lesson. Let us not place a period where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. My apologies to Tom for throwing him off. I wanted to make sure he was on his cell so now. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, trying to balance two roles for the last two and a half months or so um, gets a little overwhelming. It was one of those. Um, and so you all saw that word. I threw Tom off for a bit. Uh, it happens, right? But what's interesting is we have to remember that because there's a piece of the puzzle that is part of our administrative office. Things don't always fit well, right? What happens when you're building a I want to make it whole, right? To make the whole thing look amazing. Missing. You don't get the whole picture. Now you're like, ooh, let's work on a puzzle. And you put like five pieces and you're like, okay, where are the other 20 pieces? You don't get the whole picture, do you? See, Pride Month, it's not about being proud in the negative connotation that we're kind of advised against in the Bible. Pride Month is about being proud of the person that you are because that's how God created you. And as a former Roman Catholic, as a Chicano, as a Tejano, it's a lot in there, right? I had to, even as an adult, reconcile that God made me exactly who I am. When someone would throw a scripture quote at me, that wasn't something I hadn't heard before. When someone tried to put me down, there's times that I told them, been there and back several times. I don't want your help with that. There's one time in my uh, sociology or religion class, before class, there was a, a classmate of mine, and we started talking, and I told them how my professor had warned me that that day's lecture was going to be talking about the church and LGBT. And he's like, Gilbert, uh, I'm not going to count it against you if you choose not to come to class. This is in South Texas. So if you know anything about Texas in general, South Texas is a whole other world. And I said, OK. So showed up to class. And where I was talking to my classmate about this, I started disclosing my sexuality. And he's like, oh, really? I didn't know that about you. I said, well, it's not something I wear on my sleeve. And be like, oh, look, hi, I'm Gilbert, and I'm not heterosexual. Because how many of you go around telling people, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm heterosexual? <laughs> any of you do that? No, right? That's just who you are. And as I was explaining to this to him, he was part of a non-denominational evangelical church. So you can kind of imagine where I was like, oh, here I go again. But where I was talking to him, and I was explaining why I chose to go to class that day, knowing that some harm had come to me, it helped him kind of see something in a different 
view. And that alone made me attending class worth it. And when it came down to it, it was just like another class thing. No one really got into too much into it. And that was okay if they did. I've been part of those conversations. And as a pastor, I'll probably encounter those till the day I die. Should it be that way? No. Just like it shouldn't be that way for a woman who has children without being married. Or for a woman who's been divorced and a church looks down on her because she's divorced and now she's a single mom. <coughs> or a dad. Because we know that while maybe this community doesn't do it, there are church communities who do do that. And what happens is then you're kicking out that piece of the puzzle that belongs to that. And when we eliminate those pieces of the puzzle, you're eliminating pieces of the body of Christ. Because when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus didn't say, well, I'm only up here for the RSVP. All of us. Regardless of gender, regardless of sexuality, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of race. But often our society does not remember that. We think that Jesus is just for us. It's just for me. The church is just for me. Well, I'm sorry if you don't feel like you fit in, but I don't have to do anything about it. Well, that's not what God and Christ are telling you. See, you've noticed since I started here, I used part of what it's not... UCC uses it a lot, but other denominations use it too. No matter where you are in life's journey, you are welcome. That is important. Because when people don't hear that, they don't know if they are truly welcome or not. And those are just words. We have to act as such as well. See, for me, some of you may say, well, because he's married to a man, you say, well, he's got to be gay. I'm not. See, and I see some of your brains going, <laughs> <laughs> See, my husband, he's gay. I'm pansexual. And some of you are like, what the heck is that? And that's okay. See, in Spanish, I joke around uh, because... Spanish sweet bread is pan dulce. And it's like, yeah, it's because I love bread a lot. But no. And then some say, oh, it's because you love pans. Not, not a pan lover. So pansexual, think about it as panoramic. I don't necessarily have a, present, a preference on the gender of a person. It's more on who the person is. That I'm attracted to. And it just happened that Jacob was that person. So, yes, but there are some people who are pansexual who marry the opposite sex. And that's okay too. See, we're all unique, we're all different. And only because we haven't heard about people's sexuality in the church does not mean it has not existed. It's just our society and our Christian community has condemned it. But you see, part of my growing up and coming to terms with my sexuality, <coughs> even after I got together with Jacob, it was still trying to accept that. My own homophobia was being taken out on him as well. And sometimes I still sense it. Because it's so embedded in there that it's hard to undo. And I share that because when there's a change that happens in a church community, we're often scared of that change. And sometimes our old habits, our old comfort zone, comes back up. And yes, there'll be some quick to judge and say, 
up, then you obviously didn't change. Well, they're not giving you a chance to say, oh, okay, we did it again. Okay, let's try. Let's do better, right? And it's like looking at the piece of the puzzle, and you find the piece, and then you lose it again. Because that's happened to me. I don't know about you all. That you find them and you're like, okay, they're all accountable. Then you sit down again and it's like, oh, there's still one missing. It's kind of like that, right? You're preparing and you try to get everything squared away. But then there's a piece missing. See, when we often, as a Christian community, close the door on others, we're essentially closing the door on part of Christ's body. And so we can't come to this table and say, oh, yes, that's our Savior. Yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I'm called to serve God. And turn around on here and want to leave these doors and act a whole different way. Because then you're missing the point. And you're creating a whole different puzzle. See, when one of you is hurting, what I've learned the last few months is that one of you is more likely to come to me and say, hey, Pastor Gilbert, so-and-so had a fall. So-and-so is feeling down today. See, why? Because you don't want that piece of the puzzle to go missing or to feel like you forgot about them under a towel or something. You want to make sure that those other pieces of the puzzle still know they belong to that whole picture. That's why when I do the home visits, it's a reminder to them. They're still part of this church community. When I give them a call, when I send a card, that's all part of that. And when we don't see the importance of making sure that everybody feels included, we're not just failing ourselves as Christians or our community. We're failing God. And it doesn't matter how much money you give to the church. That's not going to make up for wrongdoings. Because when you get up there, all of us are entering the same way, without a pen. And I can assure you that God is not going to be like, well, Leslie, how much did you spend in your life giving to the church? Okay, because Donna spent way more than you. So you know what, Donna? Um, you're in the RSVP section. Leslie, um, coach? <laughs> <laughs> but you get it? We're all pieces of everything. See, and the weather lately, I know some people have been hurt, right? And we pray for those folks who have been hurt, who have passed away, and for the loved ones. But what I want you to remember is that this world does not belong to us. This world belongs to God. We are just one of the pieces as individuals, as part of this whole puzzle. And we are called to look after this earth, this planet, while we're here. And when do we have weather like this, like we had so many sirens going off this past week, it should be a reminder that you're not in charge and neither am I. God is in charge. And I, as I put after our gospel reading, which I know is something a little bit different for y'all, is God is still speaking. Do not place a period where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. That is God speaking to us and saying, you're not in control. I am. And when we allow God to truly take control, life can become a little easier 
for us to navigate. Because we have our dreams, our goals of what we want of life. Even if you're retired, you probably still have some dreams and goals. And you're trying to figure out, okay, well, what am I going to do for vacation next week? Well, you know what? I've always dreamed of going here as a vacation. That's a dream. That's a goal. Or you know what? I always wanted to give my time to this nonprofit. That's something that you're giving it to, right? And what becomes of that? You're still giving back. And you're listening to God because God has already God's hopes for us. While we may choose this route, God may have this one intended for us, or this one. And when we say, well, no, 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 I have the power to do everything. I'm the one doing it all by myself. You deviate so much from God's hopes for you. And I don't care how old you are. You still have time to listen to God. Really listen. And that includes that if you're feeling down, if you're feeling like you need something, you listen to God. Because God may answer your prayers without you knowing God is really answering your prayers. As I shared last week with Gene Boss's son, Bob, he reached out here, reaching out to Reverend Virginia. We know she's retired. I still provided her phone number. But I did let him know she's retired. She may not, you know, step up to that. Because usually when you're retired, you step away from a congregation, you have those boundaries. And she did exactly that. You are in good hands with Pastor Gilbert. Well, you notice I didn't put announcements or address or anything because he asked me not to share that publicly. But if you, Eugene Boss, you remember her and you want to go to the funeral, let me know. Because that would be on Friday. See, and he was worried. This is something new that he has to navigate on all these plans. And I said, you know what? You pray, right? And he's like, yeah, I've been praying constantly. I said, right. I said, well, you were praying to get a hold of Reverend Virginia. But God knows she's retired. So God said, well, I'm putting this other guy in your, in your way. And it's up to you to utilize him or not. And that's exactly what I did without knowing exactly what God wanted. I offered to help him. I said, in case that she doesn't call you back or she tells you that she is retired and she can't do it, I go, I am here if you need me. And he called back and said, we need you. See, and I told him, you pray for something. And while you didn't get the response you were hoping for, you still got the response you needed from God. And what he needed was a pastor who would be able to come and give his mom communion one last time and a blessing and talk with him and his wife to kind of ease some of the anxiety that they were experiencing. And at the end of the day, that's all I'm also called to do. I am not called to be outside the box and look and say, well, I don't like that piece, I'm not going to cut it. Or it's just on the edge, who cares, it won't be noticed. Or I'll just trim it right there. See, God has called me to ministry, but I also have to answer to God in that I am supposed to help each one of you. Regardless of any stand that you take. Because I have to recognize that each one of you, just like myself, are part of God's body, are Christ's body. Because when Christ was on the cross, he said, woman, there's your son. Son, there's your mother. He didn't say, well, you're only going to be mom to a certain few. That's why often I say siblings in Christ. Because our skin color, our ethnicity may be different, but we're still siblings in Christ. And the sooner we actually get that through our heads and remember it every 
time we encounter someone, the sooner we can get to a more harmonious church community. And I don't just speak about Christ Church. I speak at large. Why is it that you have survived the pandemic? Think about that. Why has this church not closed its doors? Because even in our denomination, several have closed the doors in the last year, year and a half. And you know in this town, there's several that have closed their doors. Why? Because they may not have been looking for those pieces that were missing or chose to see that those pieces were a little too bent or maybe the little sticker on top of the piece was coming off and they're like, eh, it's no good, let's just throw the puzzle away. So then what? If you throw that puzzle away, what are you doing? You are throwing God's investment away. And God will not throw you away. So why should we do that to anybody else? So I want you to remember, going forward, that yes, I'm your pastor, designated pastor, doing some interim work. It's a new experience for you in a very long time. Anxieties will come. And some pastors say, don't tell me that. It's a mental health advocate. I do tell you that because we have to recognize it because when it comes up, you want able to need me and say, hey, Pastor Gilbert, I'm really anxious about this. I don't understand it. And then we can have a conversation. And God willing, in that conversation, I can ease some of that. I'm not God, so I can't take it away. But I can help you as being a conversational partner. And know that all your efforts are acknowledged not just by me but by someone else who is always watching us and hopefully as we embrace a new employee soon that will be a piece of the puzzle that's missing in the office that hopefully will have me avoid some of the mistakes like what I did to Tom today or on Facebook where I just go fit and I was like, oh, I missed that part. Or another part that I was reminded of, I haven't changed the colors on the altar. <laughs> it happens, right? But I think you've noticed that as I talk about pieces and puzzles and what have you and embracing everybody, I am trying to be as transparent with you as possible. Because I recognize that an unknown times, Anxiety builds. And if you're not hearing it from me straight out of my mouth, your mind will start to wonder about, it. okay, this and that. And then you might, I'm not saying you do, you might engage in parking on politics. And then the story becomes like this when it's really like this. So I'd rather tell you the right way. Just like I would rather hear from you or from a loved one or a close friend in this church when you're sick or when you're feeling blue because then I can help you. And granted, even if I get told this huge story, I'm not going to necessarily take all of that. Not that I don't believe you all, but I want to hear from the person that I'm supposed to help at that moment and see how they see it because we might see it like this, right? And they might just see it like, oh, it's just a small obstacle. Y'all have been really awesome this last five months that I've been here. And I know that there's so much this church community can still do. There is so much. I don't care how old you are. Because I've heard those excuses before. Well, I'm this age. I can't do this. I can't do that. Oh, there's still a whole bunch you can do. And if you don't have a list, don't worry. I can give you one. Just like my son, he's two, and he, you've seen him. He's like, I'll help you, Daddy. Most of the time, oh, well, he can't help, he's two. But he tries. 
We can learn something from a toddler. We're not dead yet. We're still here. We still have a job to do. Just because you're retired in your corporate world does not mean you're retired from the Christian community or your Christian family. Amen. Please join me in our new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, who is in flesh, to bring us out and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence.
Lord through the prayer, this young lady who's with us today would like to say a prayer for our congregation. So, I'm do it now. Give it up. Oh, sir. She says she's called to say a prayer for our congregation, so we give her some grace and she can say a quick prayer for us. Remember that next week is our potluck, so I encourage you, if you haven't signed up, there's a sign-up sheet in the office, or you can email me during the week and let me know what you're going to bring. We'll be outside, and then the suggestion of someone who is very pushy, not good, uh, we'll do celebration outside, but then when it's time for communion, we'll move inside to the fellowship hall. You'll get yourself a plate, and we'll start communion after everybody has served themselves. So don't start eating before everybody else, because then we're going to take communion as a church family, okay, and finish our service inside the fellowship. So remember to bring the dish to share and your chair, um, and if it's sunny, well, hopefully it's not too humid outside. May the healing power of our forgiving God be with you. May God's wisdom and enlightenment be with you as you keep your hearts and minds open as you encounter more of God's children. 